as you can see the top part, it actually says Native American Heritage Month. And uh, most of my life, I kind of avoided the Trail of Tears. And it just keeps coming back because it actually is the removal of our home people. And one of the things that's interesting um, is when I decided to take a, a position here at the University of Missouri a few years ago, um, I looked up this map. Um, hopefully. My. Oh, go back one. Yeah. Okay, we'll go back. Is Brian here? <laughs> Do I have to? Okay, so I saw this and I thought, oh, that's, that's who was here. Um, um, and then I actually started looking into it further. Uh, you know, you've probably um, heard that maybe the Osage, the Missouri, um, every class that I teach at the University of Missouri, even though they're not always uh, related to uh, indigenous issues, I ask them, because we are on indigenous lands, whose land are we on? Seems like an easy question. Um, I think that, and not one student in any class of my beginning classes has ever answered that. Or have they ever named any of these people? <laughs> or that they even knew the word Missouri was a people. So I think the, the lack of education uh, of indigenous people is, is hugely missing throughout the American landscape, not only for um, non-native, but even native students. And so when I came in, I was working on trying to get in-state tuition uh, for native uh, tribes. That's right, that's my son. And uh, he's rooting me on, because um, I always thought it was strange to pay out-of-state tuition on people's own homeland. They're not foreigners. They were forced off. And the Missouri people, from what I've been told, actually never signed a treaty to leave. They were just removed. So then it actually brings up the whose who's land are we on now. Um, so I, looked, I had the GIS department look up whose land is in Missouri. And these are people that seceded land. These are nations uh, to the United States. And uh, these are all the different uh, groups that had a section of Missouri. And there is a lot more names of different tribal nations that had an uh, understanding of this place. Um, yeah, and Cherokees that got removed, so they had different people that got removed through it. And you actually had the Delaware got removed into it several different places. And the Delaware had a horrible thing where like 10 generations in a row, they just kept being removed and removed. And so different starts in Missouri and Kansas and then Oklahoma. And so when you start to learn this history, you know more about where we're actually at and what we're, we're talking about here with indigenous people. Um, so let's give a little context to the removal is that a lot of times in our history books, we think of the United States as this ocean to ocean uh, country. But this was not the case. Um, and even this, you know, I looked this up, I was like, okay, what did the map look like in around 18, 19, 18, uh, 20? There were tribal nations in those eastern lands where those states were. Even the Supreme Court acknowledged them. The United States acknowledged them, but you, know, you don't see a Cherokee nation on the map, or a Creek, or a Choctaw. Seminoles, you don't see uh, the Chickasaw. Uh, you just see colonial understanding of maps. Because of the manifest destiny that we have in this country of thinking that we have supreme right to go into whatever area that we had. And um, so, one more. Okay, so this is Cherokee Nation as it started getting whittled down from 1819 uh, to 1838. And part of Manifest Destiny is to say that uh, a group of people, not only are they not the right religion, and definitely not the right color, but they're also inferior. But if you look at this, about this time, there was a person named Sequoia. Many of the people that are interested in uh, Cherokee stuff will know about Sequoia. He's the great, 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 great <coughs> of, uh, of my son. So he's my son and my wife come from this lineage. 
And I worked most of my life with the language and the writing system that he developed, which made Cherokees, in some standards, one of the most literate people in the entire world. Now, why do you think that is? I mean, I don't believe any race is any more intelligent than the other, so it's not about a one racial intelligence above another. So we are a, uh, a maternal society, which means we get our clans from our mothers. I'm Andy Guillon, and I get that from my mom, who got it from her mom. Uh, there's seven clans. And what this means is we have a really strong tie to our mothers. And we also made sure, because we have such a strong system to our women, we didn't have prejudice like European society and even American society did. In fact, we were paying women equal pay back then, and we hope that the United States will catch up. <laughs> so, we're rooting for you. We're rooting for you, especially with indigenous women who are really low, who we didn't do that to our, our women. And so, uh, we educated our women. This was an interesting document because I thought about like, how do I talk to the removal uh, to, to people here? And I thought, well, this is an interesting uh, agreement. This is where our capital was, New Echota, Georgia area. It wasn't really Georgia to us, it was Cherokee Nation. But um, in New Echota, this document was complaining about uh, the abuse that was happening, that we had treaties that these Georgians would come into Cherokee Nation and violently take land and kick out the people or kill them. So this document was written to send to Washington. And somebody sent it to me uh, last year. And this is one of my relatives, Walking Stick. And what was interesting, the reason he sent it to me is because um, that's my wife's relative. And it's our, you know, our sons have both of this. And this was actually a document that was really interesting. Uh, my wife's uh, family is more famous than mine. but. Um, George Lowry, he was a very important uh, activist at the time. But the Indian Removal Act happened. Um, removing, they had this idea that they remove all of these eastern tribes west of the Mississippi and give them land. There's several issues with that. One, people don't want to leave their homeland, especially if they've been there thousands of years. And in the young American society that it is, still, it's hard to explain to, you, to people that haven't lived next to the same people for a thousand years what you're really doing when you're removing people from the land and their neighbors and everybody that they've been there thousands of years and what that cost really is to a people that chose to go somewhere else and leave their families and then force people out of their, their homelands. And this act was in that very nature, the result. Now, as you know, the Choctaws, Cherokees, uh, Creeks, Seminoles, and Chickasaws were the big tribes, but other tribes were also a part of the removal. And so much of the Trail of Tears history is focused in on the Cherokees, but it's not just our story. It is many indigenous nations' stories that happened. And sometimes we get um, a lot more exposure because we had a lot more uh, involvement through treaties and paperwork and we had a very literate group, so uh, that group was fighting removal in all of these ways. Um, and we also had lobbyists in Washington since the 1751, we had Cherokees, even to this day, lobbying for us. And so, so this Cherokee versus Georgia went to court after that. Because what we were gonna do is we're gonna fight them, and we're gonna fight them in their own court. And if you haven't been familiar with the Cherokee versus Georgia, it is the foundation of why a tribe is, has federal recognition. And this is the, the statement that actually causes it, is that we are nationhood. Now, the dissenting argument is better, to be frank. But both arguments said that we have a right to our own land. But the president did not follow the law. And the president had control of the military, of which the Supreme Court didn't have a military. And he said, if the Supreme Court wants to rule that way, let their military back it. Basically saying, hey, they're not in charge of the military, I'll do what I want. So Jackson did that. And so even to this day, you'll have uh, 
traditional people that not want to carry a $20 bill around. And so this, this case actually was a really amazing case that said if the majority of your tribe doesn't want to leave, you don't have to. So the Cherokees got together and went to all the different Cherokees across the nation and got over 15,000 signatures in the language and sewed it together and submitted it to Congress saying well, the Supreme Court said that we don't have to leave if the majority of our tribe doesn't. And over 90% of the, the group signed this saying we don't have to, we don't want to leave. This is our home. We don't want to go anywhere. And um, so then a small group of non-elected official Cherokees, so it'd be like if uh, we had a group of people here and they decided that they'd start their own government and sign over uh, lands in the United States to China. Well, what authority do you have if you're not a part of the government? They had none. But Jackson used this as an argument. This is from a film I made for the National Park Service um, about the Trail of Tears. Um, but this was a shot about the uh, Treaty of New Echota signed. Um, and once again, this is actually the map in 1839. So one of the things that brings me back to this place is that Missouri shows up. So Missouri is suddenly the edge of the United States. And the university, my uh, new employer, uh, just was uh, started this, the day, uh, the year of the removal. So every time I see that 1839 on shirts, it's kind of like a bitter thing. It's like, oh, that's a really awful, awful year for, for Cherokees. And so you can see next to each other the expansion of colonial ex uh, uh, governments moving in and starting states. Now, it doesn't mean that there wasn't settlers in that area, but they were starting to get statehood. And these statehoods would allow uh, the U.S. to kick out different tribes, and they were involved with uh, some really horrible things that aren't documented and people try to forget. But the only thing is, is that indigenous people are not gone. They're still here, they still have uh, nationhood, they still have communities, and they still have histories. In fact, there was a person that spoke uh, at the University of Missouri a couple years ago whose grandfather told about um, the removal of his people. He was one of the last families that was Missouri that got get kicked out of Missouri, his homeland. And so he was talking about his grandfather's land. Now, if you and I have that memory, it's still home, and it's still unjust. And so these people have that. With this land. So, in 18 or in May uh, 26, 1838, this is when the official Cherokee removal started. And this is actually, you know, they, you've t probably heard about it that Hitler learned how to take out uh, all these Jews through uh, what he, they did to Cherokees. Well, here's what he learned: you don't have to be the biggest group to do it. You actually do it in pieces. So what they did is they went section to section to community to community and rounded up Cherokees. They did the Creeks and the Choctaws and they fought the Seminoles and the Seminoles actually cost the US government more than the other four tribes combined with their war, which, yeah, they were a pretty impressive group. Um, and this is still also from the film. Um, and the removal was uh, devastating. They stuck Cherokees in uh, internment camps and um, they started processing them. And at first, they were going to do what they did with the, the Creeks and the Seminoles. They were going to send them by boat. And so there's different maps on this. Um, this is the, the camps that they stuck them in um, from the film we recreated. It was really cold. And this is the boats. Now, here's what happens with the boats is that they were going to do the same thing, but several things were going on at the time. One, you might have heard about a volcano erupting about this time, which caused a global issue, even in Cherokee Nation, across the world, and crops didn't show up. So Cherokees started getting poor and taking out debt. And so these, these once very self-efficient um, people started having to do debts with their, their white neighbors. And then, Another thing that happened is um, a drought 
happened and lowered these rivers. And so when they started taking these people on boats, um, they had three boat sections. And at one time, you see that there's four different major trails. Uh, the boat they started first, there was three of them, um, disease broke out. And one night, over 82 people died in just one night, and over half of them children. It was even shocking for the military, the US military people that were doing it. So much so, messages got back to the camps, and the US government were scared about removal, continuing in this, this process, if this is gonna kill off the, all these people, that they halted it, and John Ross, the chief at the time, was going to Washington saying, listen, you know, he talked to his people, and he said, listen, if we can do our own removal, we'll go, because obviously they're not gonna get, be able to go home. So they decided they'd go on their own, but the yellow route is uh, the bell route, and actually that was the new Chota signers, and there was a little over 400 uh, people that traveled that one. It was a small group, and those were the people that a lot of Cherokees considered betrayed the rest of the nation and their families, and they were trying to beat the binge route, which is the green route, over there, because uh, previously, in a few years, there were some Cherokees that moved over there. Um, it's a kind of a religious prophecy that this was going to happen. And so they took our religious fire over there. And these two groups were competing to get there first to try to be involved in the next government and get control first. And so these people started jetting over there. But what had happened in a few years previously to the new Echota uh, signer, and Major Ridge was one of the people that came up with this idea, is that if you give up one piece of land anymore of Cherokee Nation to an outsider, that's a death sentence. And you can be uh, killed culturally, which back then meant that someone from every clan stabs you until you're dead. And so, um, this is one of the uh, major issues that we had at the time. And mind you, the most of the people went on this northern route, which was they called the Spanish Trail. But much of it was original woodland buffalo <coughs> trails. The woodland buffalo were hunted to extinction, um, from what I understand. Um, I don't have the documentation, I was told this. Uh, 1781, I think, was the last one seen. Um, and it's different than the Plains Buffalo. But for thousands of years, they would travel along this route. And because they're animals, they're actually really intelligent of knowing water sources. So if you ever want to travel the, the Trail of Tears, which is this, it later turned into mainly highways and roads, every five or 10 miles, there's a spring, there's a creek, there's a river along this entire red route. And so, um, you know, it goes through Springfield and all of these places, and as you know, old, old uh, settlements are around springs. And so, um, we ended up in Indian Territory, and we have been there ever since. And uh, Cherokee Nation is here on the top right. It's, um, my family is from the southern part, and so is, so is my wife's. Uh, my mom's, my, my dad's wife, my mom's Cherokee, and uh, her family's been in a five mile radius since removal. So we have very old, like, like I remember I saw a lady uh, at the gas station once and she said, she didn't know me and I came in and was pumping and I, asked, I didn't know her. And she said, yeah, uh, I said, well, you know, who's your family? And she goes, well, we've been here forever since the 40s. <laughs> I was like, oh, great. She goes, everyone thinks I'm new. And for, for people that have been there a long time, you have been to, to indigenous people. That's a new thing. And so one of the things that's rough on a lot of these tribal nations that are in uh, Oklahoma today is that we're removed. And I didn't know what that meant. I'll talk a little bit about that, about what that really does to an entire people to be removed from your cultural place. Um, but education being so important, Cherokees, the first thing they did was they built schools. This was, uh, shows you the, uh, the thinking Cherokees had. Building schools first, and what we believed in schools um, is that uh, everybody should go to school for free, except outsiders. 
<laughs> we charged the outsiders a little bit of money because there was uh, they were starting to encroach on land and it was illegal for them to be there but we still wanted their kids educated because we have a theory about democracy and it was written in the uh, the state of Sequoia Constitution which was uh, ripped off by Oklahoma to, to found the state. Uh, the, the founding constitution of Oklahoma was written by the uh, Cherokee Creeks Choctaw Seminoles. 80% of it completely by it, almost 90% almost entirely, except for a little bit of 10% where they changed land ownership, banking, and things that actually increased poverty. Because before, Cherokees weren't poor. In fact, my great grandparents, they weren't poor. In fact, when you talk about Cherokees back in the day, Cherokees didn't like to work for anybody else. People worked for Cherokees, and this was a really racial component because outsiders really didn't like the idea of brown people being in charge of white people in any way. And so the people that were poor in the community were whites that coming in. They didn't own land, they weren't involved, and so they usually came in illegally. And they were um, paupers, and within a generation after they did statehood, they took all the land. So families in these Indian communities that started out really poor. They just they used the Oklahoma system and took all the Indian land. So you still have that to this day with uh, some good books about Angie DeBeau will talk about this kind of things. Um, so in 1984, this is a great group of young Cherokees. Uh, wanted to commemorate the remember the removal of the ride of, of the uh, the walk. These were at risk Cherokee youth. Now, mind you, this was no national trail or anything at the time. And these were just Cherokees from the community, many of them speakers of the language. Uh, they had people donate the bike. Cherokee Nation was really poor back then. And they were able to uh, get some sponsorships to get them some bicycles. They only had the paper maps, no GPS, no garments. They had somebody on the East Coast make them a map of the binge route, which was the green route to try to travel, and many of these people have never been 20 miles away from home. In fact, back home, uh, 20 miles, you had a different accent, in English or in Cherokee. And I remember when I'd go to the lake as a kid, you could, I would sit there as kids with our, our, just our nose above the water, and you'd listen to people talk, and you could tell where they're from, just by how they talked, and we'd giggle. And it was just a different community. It wasn't even that far away, but now it's very difficult in the times that we have with the roads and everything. So this is um, just a couple years ago. So we continue to do it. And this is one of the programs that I ran. Um, once I did that film, um, they had someone leave the nation. And I looked fit enough for someone to go, let's let Joseph do it. He knows about the Trail of Tears. <laughs> and it was three weeks until they go. and. Um, I had not done anything like this. And they wanted me to be the head of the program and ride with 16 to 24 year olds a thousand miles on bicycles. <laughs> I hadn't ridden a bicycle since I was 12. And these are different bicycles, by the way. I'm used to those pedals where you just put your, your tennis shoe on it. This was crazy. So I ended up taking on this responsibility because I knew the program was strong. And what was interesting is that people that did this program were changed. And the ones that were in 84 that started were leaders in the community. And I knew something was special about the program. I wasn't sure why. Like what really happens when people go and go to their home country and see our history and see why you're in the community you're in. And so these are, these are some pictures. There's the historical one uh, up there at the top on this left side, and then now. And then this was from 1984. This, this kid has like ripped abs. He's showing a girl. He's kind of showing off as this happens. And then we have it repeated uh, last year. And so they're kind of like looking at the 84 pictures and, and going to the same places. Um, in this trip, and most of the Trail of Tears is actually in Missouri. So most of our death and burials and things that happened happened on the northern route and happened in, in this area. And um, so it's a, a very difficult place sometimes because I spent two years geolocating 
journals that were written along the Trail of Tears. So what I mean by that is like, if, it, if uh, Butcher, uh, Reverend Butcher wrote a journal about his trip, I tried to put it at the creek he wrote it at. So that we would read this journal of what happened that day. Who died? And we did genealogy so that we tracked uh, the students so they know who they're related to on the ride. And they also know who they're related to historically of these events. Some are related to the people that died in certain areas. And it becomes a very uh, moving experience knowing the history of what happened. And one of the things that's important, too, is to think that our history is totally out of books in general. It's like a, a white version of what happened where no one allows, like, really the trauma, but also the real, like, amazing part of our people being academics. You know, um, you don't think about Cherokees being in Ivy League schools, but they're in Ivy League schools since they've been Ivy League schools. Some of them valid Victorians back then, as brown people. Which is, um, you know, we think of like, you know, native people, and we don't always we think of Plains tribe because they, they had a statistic that said 87% of what is taught to most of the people in America is from 1820 to 1889. So people don't think that we are anything but, and if we're not a certain stereotype, we're not Indian to somebody. Which is uh, a very traumatic thing for young people to think they have to be a certain thing that's not in the past. And for this group, it opens their eyes to how advanced they were. The newspaper was the CNN at the time. It was the most popular newspaper in Europe from the Americas, our paper. Boston, not the Washington Post, our paper was the most popular. We had such great newspaper at the time. Um, so this is the map I did. All those points are journals and historical sites. Uh, the, the boats are his, the, the journals. The, the boat ones were actually the toughest to do because he was riding on a moving boat. <laughs> so I had to just like pick a certain area of what he was talking about because there were several areas as they move for the journal. So I think, to me, the, the, the boat ones are the least accurate. The crosses were the internment camps. So they'd round up people in these smaller groups and then they'd move them to a larger group. And the idea is like people think that um, they had fences around everybody. The fences were just a few days. And then once you move them 200 miles, what they would do is they'd set guards up in these giant fields. And if they cross, you just shoot them. It's a really easy fence. And there's documentation about all of that. One, one uh, Cherokee guy was deaf. He couldn't hear the guard yelling at him. They shot and killed him for crossing the line. Um, so a lot of this stuff occurs, and it's all documented. Uh, Cherokees are the most documented people in the world, except for the royal family and Mormons, and then Cherokees. The US government has been tracking us uh, since about 1751 about every five or 10 years. So they know who we are. And we know who we are too. And one of the things about removal is interesting about nationhood. And what you'll find is that where Cherokees get sensitive about identity is that this was a grave of a woman that was very wealthy. Uh, she married a white man and she was Cherokee. She was getting removed and she had I think two daughters at the time and she had a choice they were going to let her stay because she's wealthy if she renounces citizenship give up Cherokee just be a white person you know, mixed daughters or half just give it up she got in her buggy and she went to the camps and she died there and they took her home. And they buried her, and her daughters went on. It's like one of the most, when you talk about who Cherokees are, this is why Cherokees are very, um, uh, what do we call stingy with each other? It's because this is who we are. We don't leave each other. And this is our newspaper today came all that way 
Well, it had stops and starts. We had the Civil War occur, and we had the mo even more death after removal in, during the Civil War period than we did in the Trail of Tears. So the paper went on and off for a while during these rough times. But it continues. And I worked personally with other Cherokees to make sure that this, our language was on computers. And this is kind of what I've done with my life. Um, I got old in this. This is uh, my first animation, the beginning they told. My whole life I was going to move away. I was a light kid. I wasn't going to do Indian stuff. As a kid, you want to be different. And I was going to move away. And my grandfather sold land, which is a big deal back home, so I could get educated. And I went to nice schools. Um, I got loans, but he helped me also go to Italy because I was going to be an artist. And um, when I got to Penn, I ended up uh, learning how to animate. And I didn't know what to animate at first. I just thought the teacher was cool. And he said, tell me a story. And I decided that's what I want to do in my life, make stories in Cherokee. So I went home and I worked with children. And we started an immersion school as a community. Um, Dr. Sly, or Margaret Raymond, a whole bunch of Cherokees started working on doing an immersion school. And I was a young 27-year-old out of grad school. And I knew some tech stuff. And I was making animations in Cherokee. There wasn't cell phones yet, uh, except for those big ones, which were cool, but no one had them. Um, and we had just pencil and paper in school. And I wanted to do, uh, figure out how we could use computers. And so we first went to Microsoft, and they said we weren't was it financially viable. And then we went to Apple, and they started working with us. And we got uh, Cherokee on the Apple computers. Uh, I still make animations today. This is Sequoia I'm working on this one. This is for the uh, new Cherokee Hospital. It's one of the largest ventures of uh, IHS of a hospital, and it's between Oklahoma State University and a tribal nation combination for a medical school. And this is actually going to play in the waiting room of that uh, hospital. Um, so I worked on this. This is actually uh, the first version of the iPhone in Cherokee that I made. And it, this is like not what's on there today. This is like 1.0. You'll notice it's the second version. The first version of the iPhone only had eight apps. But when the second one came out, um, it was so cool to have a smartphone, which was only the iPhone, really. And when people would carry it, everybody thought it was so cool. And I thought it was horrible. Because kids aren't going to use Cherokee anymore. So we went to Apple and we convinced them that we were important enough. And in 2010, we got it on there. Keyboard slightly different, uh, that's a different iteration. You can type in Cherokee, you can do contacts. Um, but it made us kind of, um, in a weird way, uh, well known. So much so that Google, Facebook, Apple all started working with us. And what we had to do is we had to go give a presentation. And it's very easy when you know your history. We know our history better than they did, and we know their history and our history. It's like, you guys only had like a 13% literacy rate, and we were close to 90. We're glad you caught up, but we need this technology. <laughs> so, we also got into Windows 8, because once we became popular, Microsoft invited us back. And they were really great and gracious, and we were able to do uh, Windows 8, now they're working on Windows 10, and uh, I still make it animations in Cherokee, which is really strange because when you start doing that work, you don't, as a young person, ever think about children. And now my uh, son's favorite song is this little syllabary song I animated uh, 19 years ago. And you know, he's seven months, and if we want him to stop crying, we play it. <laughs> we worked on the Google search engine. And the reason I show you all of this is that we are a people, that we're alive today. And that we, um, we still get these questions. You know, I get interviewed by uh, a lot of students try to interview me at the, uh, at the J school, the journalism school. It's got a great, great journalism school. But one thing that's needed in education, in higher ed, 
and all the K <laughs> to K-12 to K-20 is knowledge about indigenous people. I got asked about a month ago, what's it like to be in a modern world moving to Missouri? <laughs> well, I mean, I love the electricity. <laughs> This is, uh, this is some really wonderful people in Missouri who set up sites, write grants, help uh, commemorate what happened to our people here. And this is one of the sites. Um, they, they have grants, the Trent National Park Service has helped out a lot in marking the sites and getting more and more accurate every year about where we traveled in that time period. Because I can tell you this, is like something really special happens with our people when they learn about themselves because they spent so much of their lives not knowing thinking we're like we also learned that we were less i was actually embarrassed because i always thought like maybe i'm not quite as smart as like a real white person because i wasn't i wasn't like full white so maybe i'm not quite as smart but that's a weird thing to have as a 10 year old <coughs> and that's because i learned that in school no one taught me that, and they just told me that, you know, actually I heard a fifth grade teacher was complaining about Indian students. And, and she was new to the community, she didn't know who my family was, so. This is um, us working with the kids on blogs in Cherokee. And I show you this, it's like, it was so exciting that we, we don't only have the removal, so I didn't want to just drown you in sadness and give you statistical deaths, and I could read more journals and cry up here for two. Um, but we are a people still today. It's not a family rumor. It's not a, a, our friendships go back a long ways and our frustrations do too. Like if your grandpa didn't like somebody, you also don't like their family. So like things happen, it's long term back home. I can say that um, I'm very proud to be Cherokee and um, I've traveled that, that trail several times in cars and twice by bicycle. And I can tell you that there's a lot that you can learn uh, going back to where you're from and learning where your name comes from, where your people are from, who your ancestors were. It really is a healing process. And I didn't realize it was. I used to think, um, you know, like I know who my grandparents are and my great grandparents, but there was something more important to actually learning all of the history and how I fit in with it. So I think education is the key uh, for a lot of us and for the uh, Missouri would be wonderful to show how many beautiful cultures are here that were here a long time ago. Like you learn a lot about uh, nature, land, environmental resources. Um, the other day I, I was in a, a presentation from an Osage person that we invited to the university. And he was talking about how 60% of the world's food comes from the Americas which were cultivated <coughs> by native people, which means 60% of the world's food, uh, you're welcome, was made by native people that feed the world today. And it's something that we forget, but now that it's Native American Heritage Month, that there is an inherent value in remembering the cultures and to understand that they're not gone. Uh, they're just the state over here, they have nations and capitals and leaders and councils and uh, a wonderful amount of stories. One of the things I'll, I'll finish on is that uh, one of my friends calls and talks to me and he'll send messages in Cherokee so my, my son can get it better than my accent and um, in Cherokee and he was singing me a, a song that was about a buffalo and I was like, I, I told him, I said, buffalo? I said, the buffalo died out like 1781 or something. He goes, well, Joe, this is an old song. <laughs> <laughs> and so is a lot of the knowledge in our communities. And so on Native American Heritage Month, I think that what I hope to teach you is that there is wonderful lessons to be learned out there in indigenous worlds that are beautiful and are rich and are not lesser than any other culture in the world. And 